Are you guys ready? The uh, June 13th meeting of the Ways and Means Subcommittee will now come to order. We'll all please rise and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Roll call of the members of the Ways and Means Subcommittee. Councillor Keefe is absent. Councillor Novoselsky? Yeah. Here, Councillor Serino. Here. Here, Council President Visconti. Here. Here, and Chairman Rizzo. Here. Here, quorum is present. Thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize uh, two members of the City Council who are here, not on the committee, but participating in the budget deliberations. Uh, Ward 3 City Councilor, Councilor Cogliandro, and Councilor at Large, Mark Silvestri. Thank you very much for being here. Um, the first... Uh, Today, as you probably all know, is uh, pertaining to public safety. Uh, we'll start off first with, the, first with the police department, move on to the fire department, then the rec center, municipal inspections, and then park and control. Um, basically, what we've been doing and trying to do is pretty much stick to the budget, you know, going through the numbers. Uh, you know, we don't have to go through every single line item, but if there's any changes that are being made or proposed, um, you know, if you could just kind of identify those and then we'll open it up to city councilors and if they have specific questions about your departments, um, we'll give them as much latitude as we can, making sure that we don't keep everybody here until after our stop time, which is 7 p.m. So uh, with that, uh, first up would be the Revere Police Department, Chief Callahan. Good evening, sir. How are you? Very Austin? good, Chief. How are you? Good. Very good. Very good. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And hopefully we can get through this fairly quickly, and we'll go from there. Okay? Sure. Excellent. Sure. Listen, I'll just start off. I'm just going to read you the mission statement, and then I'll go through some of the accomplishments that we had in 22 and our goals and some of the stuff and goals and objectives we're looking to do in 2023. So the mission statement in the police department is we, the members of the Revere Police Department, are committed to take pride and are dedicated to the needs of our community in the delivery of quality police services in an effective, responsible, and professional manner. To maintain order while affording dignity and respect to every individual we encounter and to improve the quality of life through the community and interagency partnerships to thereby promote a safe and secure community for all. In 2022, the accomplishments we had, we uh, completed a, a review and update of 80% of the department's policies and procedures moving towards uh, certification and accreditation. The certification program currently consists of 159 standards, all of which are mandatory, and the 159 standards for accreditation are part of the 257 mandatory standards for accreditation, certification, and it's a significant milestone towards achieving this accreditation. And, and basically with the new police reform law that was just passed in 2020, December 2020, there's a lot of mandated stuff there that we didn't have to do before. So we're updating a lot of different policies and procedures and trying to be in tune with the state law. We're, we're pretty in pretty good shape, but there's a lot of things that go with it, and there's a lot of things that are unfunded mandates that the state is kind of going to push on the cities and towns during this. So in the next couple of years, we're going to have a lot of other things we have to deal with. But I'll get on to next. We conducted training for all members of the police department, an in-service training that focused on current legal updates, changes in mass law, and the training also provided, which focused on mental health evaluations, implicit bias, use of force, and de-escalation training. And all the training was directed towards a new police reform law, just like I spoke about a moment ago. Uh, we acquired 10 solar-powered speed signs to assist in issues with motor vehicle speeding. The speed signs helped to make vehicle operators more aware of their speeds and driving habits. 
and the speed signs appear to be successful in slowing vehicular traffic down in thickly settled, settled neighborhoods. But I mean, this is a constant problem that we have throughout the city, and it seems like it's not just here in Revere. I speak to chiefs in adjoining communities, and they're all flooded with the same complaints. And I want to say during COVID, it seemed like people developed many bad habits, and one of the bad habits was poor driving habits and a lot of speeding and issues that, you know, not driving in a safe manner. The department currently, too, is upgrading our police cruiser radios, the two-way radios, to place older analog models with new digital radios. And the digital system will provide uh, improved coverage within the city of Revere. It will also provide enhanced communication between the police department and the rec, and that's the, the dispatch center, so the Metro North uh, Regional Communication Center. We expanded the Police Athletic League program to include a, a newly created boxing program as an after-school event. The program is open every afternoon to high school students and on Tuesdays and Thursdays to the middle school students. And the program is also open to boys and girls. And on half days of school, the school resource officers or the SROs have half-day hoops and half-day soccer and the Revere High School Gymnasium. And after we purchase, you know, the department purchases pizza and drinks and stuff for the students when they finish up the program. So basically, we get them out of the community and off the street for the day when, you know, the parents are working and stuff like that. And we'll give them an alternative instead of just being outside, hanging around or being unsupervised. And we're very fortunate because we have a pretty good following. The kids really like the program. We've also had some other stuff to do around the building. We replaced the original HVAC cooling tower at the police station. The previous cooling tower initially went into service in June of 2008, and that's when the police station was initially opened. The previous unit was in disrepair and failing, and the new cooling tower is uh, an upgraded model. The new unit has upgraded features to include a stainless steel basin as well as more advanced sensors and a control system. And the new system will be more energy efficient and will have a longer working life. And the cooling tower operates year round and controls the air condition in the entire building during the summer months and limits the temperature sensitive areas in the winter months. Like, so we have some areas where there's uh, computers and servers and things like that that they have to be kept air conditioned. With the last system, we, the cooling tower was having trouble keeping up with it. So it's just one of those things that it was inevitable we had to change it out. And it was in the process of failing where we were having some substantial issues with it. So we had to replace it. We were afraid that if it went out of service in the middle of the summer, you would never be able to get it replaced. And with COVID, it made it challenging to get a new one and get people to come in and do bids and stuff like that. So it was a little bit of an arduous task, but we were ultimately able to do it. And they're still completing the project now. And finally, we developed uh, and established the Revere Police Department app, uh, a TIP 411 anonymous tip line system that's 100% anonymous. The technology removes all identifying information from the sender. Using this method, the public will be able to share anonymous tips and information with the police, and it also allows police officers to respond back, creating two-way conversation that's totally anonymous. Residents will be able to connect with the police department to learn information, view alerts, and, uh, excuse me, and submit anonymous tips from their smartphones. The system will allow Revere Police Department to send out important information to the community members that are utilizing the app system. And this app and the TIP 411 was funded with grant money obtained by the, the police department. And we're looking to put that online very soon. It's just in the process of going right now just about there, it's all set. So I, I think that'll be very beneficial to the city and the police department. And I spoke to other departments that have it near us, and they say it's been very, very successful, where they're getting information on very serious crimes and other things going on, and it makes people feel much better that they're anonymous so if they don't want their name known. 2023, goals and objectives. Number one, the goal, we're going to continue with the implementation, implementation of a new use of force policy and a new use of force reporting system, which is, uh, will separately document each use of force incident along with what type of force was used. 
There's mandatory reporting forms that must be completed by the officer as well as the supervisor to review the incident. And the objective, this is to increase the officer accountability and transparency by providing better and more accurate documentation of the use of force by, uh, use of force incidents by officers. This will make it much easier to analyze, uh, access, and share the data. And this is all part of police reform as well. Like we've had to update our use of force policy, which I'll, I'll say to be truthful, we were kind of on the money. We had a lot of stuff that was already included there before the state made their changes. We just had to clarify some things and change it around, but we were there. And with this use of force thing, now when they ask us for information about use of force, we can produce it. And I'll be honest, just important information for you folks here in the council. Massachusetts is the second lowest in the country for use of force incidents by the police. So we see a lot of stuff that goes on in the news and on TV and stuff like that. Massachusetts is on the very low end of the scale. Number two, we're gonna expand officer training in CIT, which is the crisis intervention training to further educate officers on current and updated de-escalation techniques. And this is to provide officers with a better ability to manage those persons experiencing some type of mental health crisis, which we've been doing this for several years. We're pushing to have the whole department done. And again, COVID canceled a lot of the training. And when they first started open the training, we sent three or four officers there and they had a COVID outbreak. So they had to shut the training down again and start it over. But that's been a very, very important thing that we started doing before most departments. And it's been very beneficial to have the officers understand how to deal with people having certain type of uh, mental health issues and how to deal with them. So, and I attended the training as well a few years ago and it was very, very beneficial. It was a learning experience. Number three, we're gonna to continue to review all the policies and procedures to ensure compliance with the recent mandated police reform legislation. And the objective to ensure that uh, we're in complete compliance with all the changes and updated implementation through latest police reform legislation. Number four, we're gonna increase the number of opportunities for the police officers to engage with the members of the community. Objective, the department will utilize a portion of the Shannon Community Safety uh, Initiative, the CSI funds, to expand from an enforcement-based approach to reduce gang and youth violence, to include strengthening our community partnerships through increased participation in youth events. Further, the department will focus on positively engaging with members of the youth population through home visits where relevant services can be offered. And one of these things we've been doing that uh, worked out very well with some of the Shannon grant money, and I think I mentioned it last year, they had a gardening program where the police officers and youths in the community work together, they build garden boxes. It was a, a hit. We had so much, uh, so many requests, we ran out of garden boxes. So this year we're trying to expand it and basically we work collaboratively with the DPW. So they deliver the loom for us, they deliver whatever things we need. We take over the, the wooden boxes, set them up with the, you know, with the youth, the kids in the program, we set them up and then we fill it with loom. And the residents, everybody has really uh, liked it. It was uh, a real nice thing to do in the community. So this year we're hoping to have a successful year and I think we will. So, and it was thinking kind of outside because at first I was a little skeptical. Is this gonna work? And it was a hit, very popular. So we're gonna continue to do it. Uh, number five, we're gonna utilize the recently awarded EAPS grant, that's the Equitable Approach to Public Safety grant that we just recently got, to create a behavioral health unit within the police department. The long-term goals of the EAP grant is to increase equitable approach uh, uh, you know, to public safety and public health outcomes and decrease mental health, behavioral health, and other public health needs. Objective, the Revere Police Department will create the BHU, or the Behavioral Health Unit, and hire three new civilian positions, a public safety caseworker, a program coordinator, and a behavioral health 
clinician. The BHU will be embedded in the police department and will aim to reduce unnecessary involvement with the criminal justice system for Revere residents and create alternatives to arrest and adverse police interaction, particularly for members of vulnerable populations and community of color. The Revere Police Department and the BHU will take on proactive team approach and will, they will work collaboratively to provide outreach and follow up to repeat callers and high utilizers of the emergency services. This approach strives to keep people connected to mental health services and other community resources. And the new case management will be created to you know, evaluate the data and the outcomes. This is something that I think we're going to open, we're going to welcome with open arms. Just because we have a lot of public health issues, homeless, substance abuse, and just people in general that have mental health issues that may not be getting addressed. And with COVID, I'll be honest, it probably broke the healthcare system. Some people can't get a clinician, or they're on waiting lists, or they're doing Zoom calls, or other type of remote service, which I, I just think it's not, you know, it's better than no service, but it, there's people that need help. And hopefully with this unit, we'll be able to facilitate help for them and somebody that's really at need and it's really they don't have criminal intent they just have a mental health issue so instead of being at the courthouse maybe we can facilitate some other mental health services for them and we're going to have a caseworker that'll be able to do that and also a clinician that's probably going to be a social worker or somebody with that type of background so they'll be able to you know navigate them to resources that they really need so it's something that's very important and I'm happy we're doing it Number six, we're going to implement and administer a new TASER program. And this is to replace and upgrade the department's inventory of older TASERs that are currently being used by the department as a less lethal option. The upgraded models will be the most up-to-date and effective technology currently available to law enforcement. Currently, there's only enough TASERs to equip one-third of the patrol force. The TASER program will be expanded to allow two-thirds of the patrol force to carry and utilize this less lethal option. With the tasers, that's part of police reform. We have to check all the boxes, and what I mean is we need other options with de-escalation before we go to light, lethal force, less lethal force, uh, excuse me, lethal force, where we have the ability to use a taser, which I don't think, I mean it's good, but it's not 100%, and we're going over some other less lethal options as well before the officers go to lethal force. And I can just say one thing with that. There was recently uh, an unfortunate incident down in Philadelphia where the police were not, they did not have a taser available. The city immediately went to mediation and paid $14.1 million because they didn't have that type of option available. So we're trying to upgrade all the equipment and get the best stuff we have possible for the officers to protect them and to protect the community. So, number seven, we're updating the police sidearm equipment consistent with police reform, and it's to update the current department service pistol with accessories that will aid the officers in properly identifying threats and deploying a minimal amount of lethal force necessary. The accessories in question are a pistol mounted light, which will help the officers properly identify an object in an assailant's hand and a pistol-mounted holographic sight, which increases an officer's accuracy to ensure innocent bystanders are not harmed during the course of an, uh, an officer's deploying of uh, necessary lethal force. It's just something, like, just like with the tasers, we really need it for uh, police reform and public safety. We have to do better, and everybody is micromanaging the police. We're under the binoculars, heavy. So we have to go in these directions. We're accountable for every bullet that gets fired. And I'll be honest, we had a, you know, an incident that went on about two months ago on Broadway where the officers were forced to discharge their weapons. One round was fired, subject was injured in the lower leg, and that was it. And it was in the middle of a populated time on Broadway by Walgreens. So the officers acted professionally, immediately, and addressed the threat 
and no one else was injured. So that's, we're kind of going in that direction with uh, changing the firearms a little bit. It's, it's, a, it's something that we need to do because not everybody is a sharpshooter. So we're going to start with the lower shooters in the department and move our way up to make everybody at the same level for round accountability. And it just, it's definitely the thing to do. And that's, we're going to move forward for that. Number eight, we're going to increase the amount of crime prevention cameras throughout the city and the objective to utilize the crime prevention cameras to deter and reduce crimes within the city of Revere. And additionally, the relevant video footage we'll use as a complement and provide additional evidence to investigate and prosecute crimes that have been committed in the city. Which currently we, we, we have numerous cameras and they've been extremely beneficial to helping us with things that have gone on in the city where we've had no witnesses. The cameras will be able to be the witness and provide us with information that we would never, ever gotten without those cameras. Number 10, excuse me, number nine, we're gonna complete the replacement of all the body armor throughout the department. Objective to replace and upgrade body armor that is worn by the officers on a daily basis. The new replacement body armor will adhere to the current federal standards for law enforcement body armor and promote officer wellness by being lighter weight and better storage for the officer's equipment and, and they'll fit a little better to the officers to reduce uh, you know, how the equipment's held to injuries. Because I'll be honest, we're putting some of the equipment on the carriers, but in kind of a non threatening manner and it takes the weight off the officer's hips and the older the officers get they all develop hip problems it seems and lower back issues and it's clearly because of the garrison belt the gun belt and all the equipment on it and the weight you're getting in and out of the car you're getting up and down so that's it and then with the body armor as well it's only good for about five years and then with the wear and tear it, it, you know it's we don't know how good it is. I mean, it's, it's absolutely better than nothing, but we have to change it every five years. And the technology changes as well, and it gets better and better and lighter and lighter as the years go on. And last, number 10, Citizens Police Academy, Coffee with a Cop, and other community outreach. And the Citizens Police Academy is an excellent opportunity for community members to gain a better understanding of the police, procedures, policies, guidelines, responsibilities, and laws that guide our behavior and decisions made by police officers. The Academy also provides community members with an opportunity to humanize and make a personal connection with the officers. It also gives participants an opportunity for hands-on experiences and creates a chance for police to explain law enforcement and investigative techniques in a basic and easily understood uh, terms. And the Coffee with a Cop enhances a community trust increases our police legitimacy, and builds positive partnerships with community members. And I think that's it. I mean, do we have any questions or? Okay, well, we could... Chief, thank you very much for yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, thank um, you. For going over the uh, accomplishments and objectives for FY 2023. Before we open it up to council, is are there any um, are there anything or any um, information that pertains to the budget yeah. as far as uh, changes from last year to this year that would stand out to you so that the councilors can get an idea of what that might be? Yes, we uh, deferred uh, an MIS director that we had as a civilian position. We deferred that because we have somebody in-house that's been doing it and he's been doing a exemplary job. It's one of the patrolmen who is a detective now, veteran Triftovic, and he's very well schooled with computers and he's kind of got everything up and running. And he's been working in conjunction with HIQ, which is an independent contract that it oversees all the computer system. Because you know, everything is technology now and then, you know, the knowledge increases more and more and more. So we were able to do that. So we, you know, cut that position until next year. And then we put in for some other things in capital improvement. Like, you know, we added a couple more positions 
uh, police officers positions because we have three that are funded by the school department, the SROs, so we're trying to backfill them and hire additional officers. Okay. And if you look at some of the monies with the uh, capital improvement we put in for uh, another police cruiser, we also put in for a, a Ford Exposition as a command supervisor vehicle. And the reason why I got something that, uh, you know, we opted or were looking for something that was big because we need it for police reform and equipment and things like that so we can have less lethal equipment on the street all the time and then some other emergency equipment we can have available. And then if you go a step further, just with the change in times we're having, it seems like we're having an active shooter event every other day. So we're trying to make sure we have as much equipment as possible available to the officers to utilize if they need it. And with that new truck, it's going to help have it out there and we'll be able to bring them the equipment they need. And we're also putting it in the police vehicles as well. All right, Chief, thank you. Uh, members of the committee, anyone have questions for the Chief? Council President Visconti. Hey, Chief, thanks uh, for being thank here. Uh, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, I want to, just a couple of, I have a few questions, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, starting off with staff. Uh, yep. It looks like we have a total in the department of about 110, if that yeah, I think serves it's 109, me. 110, 109, yes. 110, I think 110, including yourself, yeah. uh, maybe. Um, the How many active uh, police officers do you have? Uh, obviously, we're probably minus. around 102, and there's for different various reasons. We had some people just change their mind and they want to retire. Okay. We've had some people with medical issues that uh, are going to retire. And then we've had some other uh, on-duty related injuries that officers are probably going to ultimately retire. Okay. So they're just kind of tied up in the system. You know, is, is, there a, um, is, is there an appetite to um, get some, I know it's not an easy position to fill these days. Uh, but uh, is there an appetite to increase those numbers um, back to active at the 110 number? Yes. A couple of reasons, and it's, uh, I'm happy that you acknowledge that the appetite's not there. Yeah. We, we're in dire straits like most police agencies around the country, and everything, everyone around here is in the same position that we are. And here's an example. We're going to try to hire some people. We went through 35 candidates to get four. And just the desire for the job is not there anymore. Yeah. And I mean, you counselors, you know, I mean, Mr. Mayor, you know how many people wanted the police job before when you were the mayor? A lot. Now no one seems to want it. Or they change their mind midstream. They're a good candidate, they're in the process. Nah, I've changed my mind, they have something else to do. Uh, you know what I'm saying, I found another job. That's one problem. And the other problem is there's not enough police academies. There's a line, a waiting list to get on the police academy, that, to get into it. And the state's trying to open a new regional police academy up in Linfield where I hear it's almost ready to open. Uh, it's real close. They're ready to do it. And they're claiming they're going to be able to run multiple classes at the same time. And hopefully they can do that. Because we're just in dire straits. It's very, very difficult and challenging. And yeah. uh, we'll get through it. But the dynamics has definitely changed. Um, if uh, when you talked about um, police reform, I, mm -hmm. I know we had multiple discussions uh, about body cameras. Yep. Uh, um, so uh, where are we with something like that? And uh, and you mentioned the SROs, the three yes. SROs. Uh, your thought process on maybe increasing that number? Okay, with all the things that you know, with the things that have been going on, do you think there's a need? for the city to, uh, to really increase that SRO number, you know, one or two uh, more SROs in our school department? Yes. On your SRO question, absolutely. Uh, I would like to enhance that and put a couple more offices in the school department to, to serve with the schools. And as soon as we start to build the manpower up, we'll definitely, that's one of the first things we're going to visit. Okay. And currently, at the situation, fortunately, we're at the end of the school year. 
but just to assist the schools and to put people's you know fears in check a little bit we've had a lot of the day shift patrol units at all the area schools answering their calls from the schools going in checking on the schools to give people a little bit of comfort so we've been trying to keep a proactive approach there but we're, we're definitely I would definitely be interested as well as the uh, Superintendent of Schools of Higher and some more SROs. And if I can just uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a little leeway here. I'm going to, I'm just going to look at, I looked at the numbers, and uh, obviously a lot of these numbers seem to be pretty much level funded. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I noticed uh, there is a consulting service uh, fee or uh, expense here that was budgeted in 2002. Um, wasn't used and now it's being budgeted again for a hundred thousand in 2003 2023 so can you just elaborate a little bit on that yeah I'm not sure what that exactly is absolutely it's a uh, health and wellness for the police officers we're gonna get some additional training for them okay. and counseling whatever they need yeah. and last year I, I think a big part of the problem was COVID and I hate to keep saying COVID is an excuse, but COVID uh, decimated the police department from November to February. At some points, like 30 to 35 percent of the officers were out, you know, either quarantined or legitimately had COVID. It was it, just awful. Yeah. And it was probably the same thing with the fire department, the DPW, school department, and everything else. But uh, we're going to use that for additional training, health and wellness stuff and give the officers some other avenues to take care of themselves. Because can I be honest with you? Over the years, I've been on this job over 30 years. We've always eaten our own. And what I mean is, it's a bad scene. You go to a critical incident, don't worry about it. Go home and change, you'll be all right. Oh, gee, go home early tonight, but be back in here tomorrow. No seeing a clinician, no talking to somebody, no trying to get somebody to debrief you. And you know, now that we're talking about it, we entered into a program called SISM. Basically, it's crisis intervention and stress management. It's peer support from other police departments around the area, and if we have an incident, which we've had numerous ones, from either a death of a child, uh, a real horrific scene, bad accident, officer involved shooting, whatever it is, we call that SISM group, and they will send several officers from adjoining communities just to debrief you and speak to you and see how you're doing. And we've done that. And that has been remarkably successful. It's given the officers a little bit of a breathing factor, calms them down a little bit. But also with the SISM group, because they're all trained, and we're also part of it. We have several officers that are involved in the SISM program. So if there's an emergency in Cambridge, Somerville, Everett, somewhere else, we'll send three officers over there if they're available to assist. And it's, it, one hand washes the other. It's worked out very well. But also, like I, I started to say, They'll do an assessment. They'll say, listen, we think David's okay. We think he's ready to go back to work. Or no, we think David needs a few more sessions and maybe we're gonna sit him with a clinician. And we've had that happen as well. And it's really helped out quite a bit. It's definitely been remarkable. And I think you, you know, you're doing the police officers justice. You're helping them out, you, you know what I'm saying? They can get some of the emotions out, they can feel a little better about themselves, and they can talk to their peers, who people who understand them. Thanks, Chief, and thanks for everything that you do for the city. You're welcome. You Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. We're trying, but I'll be honest, it's, it's difficult times right now. It's the most challenging I've ever seen in 30 years. Any other members of the committee? Uh, Councilor Novoselsky, then Councilor Silvestri. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, I'll tell you, some of these things that you've put on these accomplishments, I had no clue what was going on down the street. Yeah. In, the, in the department, and I'm very pleased that I see a lot of this stuff going on with the PAL League and, you know, different things. But uh, two, actually three things I, um, I have in my, my uh, target, and I know we're talking citywide. What, what was your question? I'm sorry, I didn't. I haven't asked it yet. Okay. I know we're talking citywide and a lot of stuff, but being a ward counselor. Okay. And over the last five or six years, I've requested things to be done down in the in my neighborhood mm -hmm. that I'm still waiting for. And here I see you getting 10 solar-powered speed signs. Mm -hmm. And I see them all over the city, which is great because people tend to speed. I have one in my neighborhood. And that is, is it on Centennial? Ave, on Campbell, Campbell Ave. And I've been looking for one on Centennial Ave, heading yep. up the hill. 
and one down at the school on Standish Road near Curtis. Okay. So those are the two things that I've been asking for a long, long time. Okay. That still haven't seen yet, and I know you're always asking for at least ten every year, and I know you get some from you from the uh, area uh, through Boston and all this kind of that that team you have out of Boston. Uh, I'm not sure. Uwasi? Or are you Uwasi, talking the yes. urban security? U Uwasi, yes. Well, Uwasi hasn't funded them. We got some money, I think, from other avenues to yeah, do but, them. But, I mean, we can talk about it. We can revisit that you know, and talk. So, and we give you know, it to some of the most critical, crucial areas, and we're trying to get more. You know, I'm trying to get on a plan that we get so right. many every year well, and divvy them out. You know, and I'm saying, you know, like, I, like I said, I have one in my neighborhood. Okay. And people are constantly, and you know, and Sergeant Janino knows that I constantly complain about calls, cars speed. speeding. And from, from the neighbors, not just that I see it, but I hear it from the neighbors. I hear it from the root, from the grassroots people. So it's not that I'm just throwing stuff out in the air that we want it. There's a reason we want it. No, so absolutely, and I think it helps want, the community. We just want to get our, our fair share down there. Okay, so. you know what? We can talk about it. We'll have a discussion about it, and we'll try to get so something on a priority two. list for you. Thank you. And uh, the other thing was cameras. Mm -hmm. You know, I have been asking for a camera down in the corner of Kimball and Walnut Ave. Mm -hmm. It's a bad intersection. People speed. We try to put uh, uh, stop signs there. You know, the traffic yeah. commission installs. But the people are flying down there. So are you looking for, like, a traffic camera? You're talking at that intersection? Anything that works that will pick up the intersection and plus maybe anybody that may be dumping stuff down there. Because you know, it works in the same same neighborhood. Okay. So we're looking. You know, I've been asking for that for many years, and we even had a pole put in there for you. You know, for someone to put the camera there to face that dead end of Walnut Ave at Kimball. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, and I know uh, Councilor uh, Rizzo mentioned it the other night in a motion about the uh, substations. Yes. So I know. You know, there was one on Pleasant Street, and we, and we had, and uh, Captain, uh, I mean, was Chief Guido had one put down on Shirley Ave in the, in the new Veterans Building. And I noticed that that has not been used. It's been given out to the Board of Health now for them to utilize. So, and I do see it in the budget that you have, you know, rentals for two locations for, you know, the $30,000. Uh, what's going to happen with those locations? Well, we're getting back on track through COVID, and we had some other offices out injured. We're going to start opening those substations up. We have a plan to try to get those back up and running. Are you going to and I'm share happy those? you brought that up. Are you going to share those with the departments that are in there now? You know, we've used it as, as space. I think there were some issues that they need a little space, so we let them utilize it. But we're going to start going back into those spaces. Because I know the, the Pleasant Street location was always used for fingerprints. From all the yes. know, immigrants looking for, you know, for prints, and now they have no. You know, well, I, I, I have no clue where they go now. I want to say they've been doing it limited at best at Pleasant Street. He was doing it down at the actual police station on 400 Parkway, mm -hmm. but we're revisiting that, especially you know once the, the the summer comes, to have people at those substations, and we have three people getting out of the police academy, so we're going to utilize some of the bodies that we get. Okay. And I'm, I am glad to see about this uh, Revere PD app and the tip 411. That sounds yes. excellent. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm deeply involved with my neighbors, and they usually come to me because sometimes they, don't, they like to get the inside track to you guys. And hopefully that will, you know, relieve me of some of the mm -hmm. issues of dealing with, uh, you know, some, the gang unit and the detectives and stuff like that. So, but overall, you know, I, I thank you, and, uh, you know, you know we, supply, we support you a 1,000%. You know, what you're going to need and what your needs are, and we have been over the years. So that's all I have and to I, say, Mr. Chairman. Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Silvestri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chief, thank you for being here tonight. Um, not a question, just a comment. Um, looking over some uh, statistics that are put out from the FBI <laughs> crime statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to commend the city of Revere because we are one of the lowest in the nation in all categories for police use of force, um, deadly force, firearm incidents. Um, 
So that is kudos to you um, in the elements that we're facing today's day and age um, to, to have your police officers be above board and, and professional all the time is, is I tip my hat. Um, and uh, that's, that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to commend you on that because that, that is uh, something that stands out if you look and it's, and it's impressive. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just attributed to a lot of the training that we're doing, extra training that's been done the last several years with the offices, and it's definitely paying off. And I've even had the district attorney's office, as well as the investigators out of the district attorney's office, comment on how well-disciplined and trained the police office, offices are here in the city of Revere, where they were surprised at how we kept it on the lower end and not really super escalated something. So it is remarkable, and thank you. Thank you. All right, Chief. Well, it looks like uh, nobody else except for myself just has some okay. questions. I just yeah. have a few. Uh, the ones pertaining to the budget were already asked, which, you know, the consultants, the $100,000 yep. on the consultant, and I think you explained that. Um, and uh, I, I do have a question. Um, yeah. But before I ask the question, I guess just fundamentally, I, you know, it's amazing what you guys have had to go through, and I guess I'm talking through you to the men and women who work for you. Um, you know, you got people around the country, and we all know it, they're screaming for defunding the police and this and that, and then of course you have tragedies that happen and they want more, you know, more police response and more police action. It's not an easy job what you guys do, and I don't think the general public realizes it. Uh, the type of calls that you get for service, it's not just all for barking dogs and things like that. You're dealing with dangerous people um, that are out there, and it's and uh, you know from 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 people I talk to, it seems to be getting more dangerous. Um, so you really, it's you know, it's really a scary situation when you're dealing with m more dangerous people on a daily basis. But they want you to be uh, more considerate and uh, and less forceful. Um, it's it's a, I, I give you credit, I give you men and women credit, because it's not an easy job. And I think that goes back to why you said earlier, geez, when you were mayor, everyone wanted to be a cop. Now we can't get anyone to be a cop. Well, you know, sometimes two and two does equal four. And there is, you know, that's the answer. Because to go into a situation like this, where the minute you uh, put on a uniform and, uh, you, know, you know, you're automatically... Um, you know, uh, accused of being guilty before, you know, innocent is a, is, it's a really, really tough job. And I've watched this over my history here in the last 22 years of public service here in the city. And um, to me, I'm only one person. I don't know, but it's disgraceful. It's disgraceful that everybody doesn't appreciate the job that you guys have to do each and every day. Um, I just have a couple questions. As far as a line item, you got... $5,000 allocated to the drug unit. I mean, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the drug unit? Because I know that, you know, nationally, fentanyl overdoses are up. I can't think that Revere is uh, unique and somehow we're, we're you know, we're, we're bucking that trend. I, I have to think that there's still a significant drug problem out there. And I just want to know what we're doing as a community with respect to our drug unit is it effective? Are we, are we are, you know, are you finding that, you know, maybe just tell me a little bit about the drug unit and the work that they're doing. Well, there, what I would get into general cases, they've been involved with doing many different investigations. They'll either do their own investigations or they all work investigations collaboratively with the DEA or with the state police, the troopers out of the district attorney's office, uh, you know, the state police assigned to the attorney general's office. So they're currently working cases on a regular basis, uh, criminal cases, executing search warrants, arresting people with fentanyl. And I want to say a little while back they had a significant arrest where they got several hundred grams of fentanyl. It just, we're flooded with it like every other community. And it's awful. But they're out there working with the Criminal Investigation Division and they're pushing forward every day. It's just a, a very difficult situation when you know, due to COVID and everything else, the overdose has spiked. There was over 100,000 people passed away in the country from an overdose death, all attributed to fentanyl. And the fentanyl is in everything. The fentanyl is 
they're pressing it into pills. So someone may think they're getting one certain illicit pill. Meanwhile, it's not that illicit pill. It's a fentanyl tablet. And we're seeing uh, fentanyl tablets and vapes. Uh, we're seeing fentanyl and everything. So it's definitely a challenging thing, but they're working every day and they're doing their cases. It just, it's more difficult too because courts look at things differently. People are looking at drug offenses. It's not a big deal anymore. And you know, it's unfortunate. And that's kind of in the climate we're in. But they're doing cases every day and they're pushing forward with investigations. It's just some of them are arduous and take a long time. And you want to build a good case so it ends up in superior court or uh, gets uh, prosecuted. Okay, because I, I just saw that $5,000 line item for yeah. the drug unit, and mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out what that $5,000 was for. I mean, what is the $5,000 for? Okay, I wasn't sure you, you weren't aware. It, usually they use it for buy money, and I would say that's kind of on the low okay. end to, to purchase, purchase illicit narcotics. Okay, so... Um, so then built into the rest of the budget would obviously yeah. be uh, people that are just part of the drug unit? Is that, you know, yes. the officers we, would be? Yep. Okay. We have several detectives that are assigned to the drug unit. We also have a liaison that started a few years ago from the sheriff's department that works with us every day, along with those troopers when we need them. Okay. And works out well. Well, that's, you know, we, I, you know that's just a, a big concern because fortunately, and I was looking at your statistics yeah. about crime across the city from 2022 and now, in, I mean, from 2021 yeah. now into 2022. And the numbers look pretty good. Uh, well, not good, but um, I guess, uh, you know, it's not going in a horrible direction. I mean, in some cases, it's there's less depending upon the offense. But, um, you know, Councilor Novoselsky had alluded to the fact that um, I did put a motion a couple of weeks ago asking about these substations because I think they actually made a difference, at least having a presence up in the different areas where the station's not, you know, and uh, so, um, you know, hopefully that's something. I know you had said that because of COVID, and, and but hopefully that's going to be something that we'll be able to take another look at somewhere during maybe 2022 and kind of restaffing those because I think they served a very vital purpose to the residents and uh, if not anything else, made people feel safe. We've got this new tip line now, but there's a, you know, for someone just to be able to walk into a substation, because as you know, and you worked many years next door here. Yes. But that's no longer there, right? So this is right in the middle of the city. You know, for someone to maybe get down onto Route 16 and go talk to someone down there, who knows? I mean, maybe if it's serious enough, maybe people will, maybe they won't. But I just found it to be, I found it to be an asset. I found it to be uh, an asset to the public. So I'm glad that you're considering that. Um, you know, going forward, those uh, two locations, at least this one location. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I know Council Novoselsky would like to see one back down on Shirley Ave as well. So uh, They are very successful, and I'm looking forward to, you know, restaffing them and having somebody there Excellent. to be able to be around. It makes a big difference. And even the one down on Shirley Ave, you get some of the residents, they'll come in. They little apprehensive at first, but once they feel comfortable, the same people will stop by every day or every few days. Excellent, excellent. And this just, um, well, uh, you know, uh, Council President Visconti asked about retirements and backfilling yeah. and transfers and all that stuff. So, um, you know, you, I think you said that you think we have about 102, we're budgeting for 109. Is that it? You think there's 102 actually active? Yeah, okay. we, we have some people on leave. One gentleman's coming back. But we have a couple people that are going out. So it's very tough. We're always losing about 10% of the place for one reason or another. Injuries, health issues, medical, people getting prepared to retire. We're running into a thing now that we're forecasting we're probably going to have to hire 15 or 20 people. And what I mean by is, remember President Clinton had the crime bill? Going to hire the 100,000 right. cops? We hired over 40 police officers, and that was in the mid-90s. They're coming up to retirement age. And several guys have already talked about they're going to retire. And in some of the provisions in the CBA or the contract, they're allowed to use some of their accrued sick time and things like that. And I've already had a few offices that are great offices tell me, hey, listen, February, I'm going. February 23, I'm out. Another guy, hey, listen, I'm out on this date. Another guy, I'm on the fence, I'm going to go. I mean, just with this current climate, we had one officer just stop coming to work. 
banging out sick, so I thought there was something seriously wrong with him. I get him on the phone. He just said, listen, I, I think I've had enough. I didn't do anything to anybody. I've served the community for 25 plus years. I was in the military, never had a problem at all. And I think one time too many, the camera phone in my face, I had enough. Yeah. And he retired. He took it, he was gone within three months. He says, I'm using my time, I'm out. And well, yeah, I, I just, I'm just gonna say one more thing. Yeah. And then I think Councilor Novoselsky has another question, but um, yeah, I, I think it's important and I understand the limitations with the academies and all that stuff, but we really need to start thinking. I mean, you know, um, we were, as a community, I guess, uh, you know, the administration was celebrating the fact we were the largest growing city yes. in Massachusetts, but there's ramifications that come with that. There's student population, the, you know, just from your perspective, from a public safety infrastructure. I mean, how do you keep handling more and more population with the same number of police officers? So I would hope that you're having discussions about this growing population and how we're going to service that growing population with respect to police, fire, um, emergency services with Cataldo. I don't know how many ambulances they have staffed here throughout the city. So, um, you know, we need, you know, we always, we always took pride as a community in response times, whether it be police, fire. I don't know if those are still where they were or, what, or if they've been impacted by the number of people that live here. But I think we really need to make sure that our staffing levels are adequate to serve the population that we have and the population that's going to continue to move into the city. So um, hopefully those discussions are ongoing with the with the mayor and absolutely I've had numerous discussions with him and you know everybody looks at it the positive light I have to say one thing I talk to chiefs in other communities I'm fortunate here I don't have the problems with the town council or the city council or the mayor or the town manager that other chiefs have this city government is very pro public safety and I can't thank you folks enough for that there's other cities where I hear they you know, the police aren't the most important thing in the budget. The, you know, the fire department's not. They're worried about other stuff. Public safety is everything. Chief, you don't have a, you know, you don't have a good police no. department. Everything else becomes less important. You can't send your kids to school worried that they can't get there safely. Or you can't, yeah. you know, as a senior citizen walking down Main Street, walking down Broadway, walking down the central business district, you want to feel safe doing that. And the only way you're going to do that, in my opinion, is making sure you've had adequate law enforcement, um, you know, walking patrols like we used to have. I mean, if yeah. we could maybe even revisit that. So we're coming into the summer months now, so a lot of that stuff is going to take on more importance. Hopefully we can staff it because I'm a big proponent of that. I think it makes a big deal, and it just puts people at ease. They right. see the police officer walking around. He shows up at the bank. He's in front of the firehouse. He's over there. He's, you know, he's around. If people would mention it and it had a positive impact. For yes. Sure. Councilman Novoselsky. Just uh, two quick things, if I may. Do we have a reserve list? No. Did we ever establish one? It was something that I think was done in years past, and it just wasn't beneficial to the police department. I, I think it took too long to appoint people. You get a guy who's on the list, he's 34 years old, takes five years to appoint him. Now he's 39, 40 years old. That's what some of the problem is with the reserve lists. And civil service is trying to accommodate you know, the police departments a little more. They used to give the exam every two years. Now they've done it every year, the last couple, because the lists have been so poor. I'll be honest with you, they've been bad. So they're trying to build up the lists. So I'm hoping the next list that comes out probably in the next 90 days is a decent list. And we can try to get some slots in the academy and hire some people. You, you, I know a lot of people transfer in and out from other departments into our departments and vice versa. And I just thought maybe the uh, reserve lists being what we were talking about, the 35-year-olds, was f from maybe 10, 15 years ago. Now they're the younger people. Maybe they'd want to get on the list and be able to utilize it if they wanted to transfer in. I mean, they could look at that, but the, the transfers now, and here's the problem. We've had officers wanting to come here from other departments, and their chief has said no. Hmm. Or their mayor or town manager has said no. Because the problem is they can't replace them. Hmm. There's just no one out there. And, you know, a lot of guys are getting out. I'm, I'm talking to the bigger departments, and they're having a lot of guys get out. They're not even at the full 80%. They're taking 75%, mm -hmm. 73%, using their military time, yep. and they're just saying, hey, I'm out. Right. 
So that's what the problem is. We're in challenging times, but we'll survive it. We can persevere and push through it. Yeah. And one last Thank you, thing. Bear. One last thing. Uh, what, what's with our auxiliary? How well, are they doing? Are we, do we have a full staff? Can I be staff? honest with you? We're not utilizing the auxiliary at all anymore because of police reform. The training standards have been raised so high, there is no way we can keep them at the training that we're keeping the regular officers. Not even close. Mm. They want them to go to a bridge academy that's a significant amount of time, and now the city's responsible for them. Never mind, one, the financial cost, but two, for someone who's a part-time employee at best, we're responsible. So if they get on the academy and they get injured or something happens, because it is kind of physical, some yeah. of the stuff they have them doing, now it's the, the, the city has the burden to take care of them. Right. And it just, it's a problem, it, I'll be honest, it, it, and I'll finish off, <coughs> it's been a problem with a lot of departments that now are having issues with the state over the police reform law because smaller places utilize reserve offices, auxiliary offices, instead of hiring full-time offices. And now they're just adding it into the budget. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So now you've got to give me a $500,000 increase because I can't use the part-time people anymore. Yeah. And now I have to hire full-time officers with benefits, health and welfare, and everything else. Chief, I just have, I just have, and then we're going to close because the fire yeah, we're taking too has much to time. come up. Yeah. But I, I just have, I just have one, one last question, and it has yeah. to do, uh, it's probably a collective bargaining issue, but I've had, I've just had conversations, obviously being around the city, yep. you know, people talk about it. Is there any plan to maybe go back to four and fours instead of split shifts, or is that uh, Well, one, it's a contract issue, but two, th there's a lot more logistics to it, so if you want to have a side conversation, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's and just I would love to have a conversation. I know been conversation about it. I don't know where that's at, how that's affecting, we, you know, morale we, or whatever. I would love to have a conversation with your counselor. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a cup of coffee or a sandwich, and we can discuss it <laughs> absolutely on I'm the sure side because you know it'll find be. A me. Uh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Great. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. Great, Chief. Thank you very much for that presentation. Hey. Tell the men and women that they're doing a great job. We're proud of the Thank work you. that they do yes. and that that you all do to uh, protect the residents of the city. Thank you. They appreciate it as well. Thank you Thanks, very much. Chief. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for appearing. Um, Chief Bright is here. Chief, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to call up the fire department now. Uh, for the edification of the city councilors, uh, the fire department is page 62. Good evening, Chairman uh, Rizzo. Uh, please uh, pardon my mask. I'm just getting over a bout of COVID myself. Ooh. I don't know if you'd like me to proceed uh, as my friend Chief Gallahan did and, and go down the line of all our stuff, or would you like to cut to the uh, chase yeah, on Chief, the budget? Yeah, Chief, I think in the interest of time, I mean, I don't mind you just going through and just briefly going through some of the things that, you, you, that, that you've done. Maybe explain to some of the councilors what your plans are, just in the kind of aggregate going forward. Um, and sure. then you can go through the budget if there's anything that we should know about, and we'll open up to questions at that point. Sure. Well, uh, we're very excited that this past year um, we have two fire engines on order. They should be here by the end of the summer, and we really need them. Um, so uh, last I heard, they're on the line. They'll be assembled uh, as we speak, and we hope to be making a trip down there and hopefully uh, getting them by the end of the summer. So that's, that's great news. Um, we have a grant pending for 17 firefighters that we should be finding out this summer. Um, that grant was put in in anticipation of the engine and two Point of Pines fire station. So um, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. Uh, if you look through our presentation, you know, my, my staff has been incredible um, writing grants, you know, um, right down the line. My entire staff has been pitching in and, and writing grants with FEMA, URC, uh, on and on, MEMA, on and on. You can see a whole list of stuff that um, the department has been successful in, in getting grants for new, for new gear dryers, three new gear dryers. We never had gear dryers before. Um, a, a second washer extractor machine that went down the parkway station. Um, we're anticipating the delivery of a high water rescue vehicle this year, hopefully by the winter time, that's, that's much needed in the past, 
you know, recent history, we've, we've seen the issues we have with storm surging and flooding. So um, a high water rescue vehicle in the city will be, will be uh, much, much welcome. Um, we have a grant. We're waiting um, to install a new emergency generator up at headquarters. That's the, the one we have now is over 31 years, uh, over 30 years old, and it's in much need of repair. Uh, this past year, we have hired uh, eight firefighters, uh, six we've sent through the academy. They're fully trained and, and uh, on the line, and we have two currently in the academy uh, as we speak. The main, uh, as far as the 23 budget, we're very excited to increase our complement to 120 firefighters. And as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chair, as the city's growing out, we've been trying to anticipate that growth and, and try to uh, up our personnel as necessary to, uh, to plan for that. Um, so with the addition of those positions, also we're looking to add a, um, a civilian mechanic to the department. The fire apparatus over the years has become very complicated and uh, very difficult, and we don't really have great facilities to work on them. But we've done our best, and we think with the addition of, of a, a mechanic, that will help, help do a lot of our uh, preventive maintenance and, um, and, and prevent a lot, a lot of unnecessary breakdown of apparatus and stuff like that. Uh, We were trying to give some of the older fire stations um, some TLC, the, the Engine 5 station. We had to show up the apparatus floor because it was, it was starting to um, become in disrepair. We were concerned about that. I mean, ultimately, we'd like to replace that fire station down to the Wonderland site. Uh, that station's over well over 100 years old now, and um, it's kind of un, un, uh, outgrown its usefulness, although it is very key being in that location. Um, without anything down the point of pines at this time. So those are the major things that jump out at me, but we're really, we're really excited about uh, anticipating delivery of the two, the two fire engines. We just got a new command car put into service this, about, about a month or two ago. So, and, and with the increase of this personnel, I think the fire department is, is uh, well equipped to meet the challenges this coming year. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Any councilors have questions? Council President Visconti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Chief, for being here. I hope you're doing better um, and recovering. Um, I want to uh, first start off by uh, commending you. You know, uh, you look at this, and uh, I just happen to see this quickly, and, you know, the 5,300 plus calls under five minutes. You know, I, I want to commend your department for that. That's, that's an amazing uh, task. I know you guys uh, work diligently to try to get that number and that time as quickly as possible, but that's a, that's a pretty impressive uh, number. So I want to commend you first on that. Um, but I, I also would like to direct uh, the, the, the question in terms of the fire apparatus, which has been a, a, a big concern um, this year. You know, you, you notice that uh, uh, I know residents have seen other uh, cities' trucks being used, and I know we have two on order. Um, now, with the uh, Point of Pines fire station coming, um, how many trucks are going to be there first and foremost? Or, uh, uh, yeah, let's start off. The with plan that. for the Point of Pines fire station, when it originally opens, will to, to run engine two out of there, have a bay that has the capacity for a ladder truck, but there will, will not be one put in service down there at okay. that time. We may be storing a spare piece of uh, aerial apparatus down there. Okay. And then there's a third bay for water rescue. We'll have our watercraft okay. down there. All right, thank you. I, I mean, my, my, my question here is, and it might, uh, may, maybe Rich might be able to. Uh, chime in as well. Um, we have two on order that I believe we've bonded. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And uh, is there a need um, for more fire trucks? And, well, I think I, th I, I left out in, in my presentation, we do have a grant in 
In addition to that grant for 17 firefighters to man that station, we also have a grant for a new fire engine. Okay. I won't know. Yeah, I, I, I guess my concern and where I'm going with it is we, we've got, we've received $30 million in opera money. Okay, and, and from what I'm understanding is we can use some of that money to purchase uh, equipment. You know, something that, and, and I know we've used the, uh, uh, some of that money for different programs, you know, um, some personnel, so forth and so on. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm looking at some um, apparatuses that are going to last 20, 30 years or ho however long they last. So to get some, um, some bang for my buck, as they say, you know, something that we're going to keep long term. So, you know, I, I, I'm a proponent of using some of that money to, to, for, for some uh, fire trucks if, if, in fact, that's needed. Well, this, this has been a hard year, Mr. Yeah. President, as far, as far as the fire apparatus is concerned. And it wasn't just one element. It was, it was like a, a, a perfect storm of a lot of different things. Uh, not the least that was COVID, because when you send your fire engine, we don't really have the facilities to work on them here. When we send something out, a lot of mechanics weren't available. A lot of people were out sick. They couldn't hire uh, enough mechanics. The parts weren't available. So you send your fire apparatus out to get repaired. It should be back within several weeks or a month, and that turns into three months or six months. Um, a lot, we had a lot, a lot of emergency type of things fail on us. That was, it was just... Uh, unforeseen really and as the stuff was in the shop more and more things were uncovered yeah. so years ago we'd just be you wouldn't see a fire apparatus from boston or, or we didn't borrow one from uh Mal, or, you know malden or everett or chelsea we just put it out of service and then that apparatus would be browned out that's how we were running that was our standard operating procedure for years well we haven't done that Okay. In six six years, I guess that's borrowing apparatus. Yeah. Whatever we need to do, we get the apparatus. We put it in service. And if and if a, say for instance, if a ladder truck's out of service, we run the city with two ladder trucks. If one ladder truck's out, like currently we have one out being repaired, we load up on that remaining apparatus to make sure we have abundant personnel if something were to come in. Because it's really not the fire engine or the ladder truck that does the job. It's the personnel. Yeah. So I want to ensure we have that same personnel on duty. And we've been doing the best we can. No, and I, and I want to commend you on it. it it's not that. I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to, uh, you know, like I'm a proponent of, of getting you the tools needed to do your service. So if, uh, if a truck is, uh, uh, a fire apparatus is needed, you know, then, you know, maybe we should look into spending some of that money for uh, um, spending some of that opera money, you know, for... Uh, for trucks that are going to last, and, and we have something to show for it. So uh, uh, I was just want, I wanted to pick your brain on on. I'm sure you could use. I would never argue <laughs> about getting another truck or, or so. So I, I understand that, and uh, I, I think that's something that we should, uh, as a city, look into because uh, it uh, it makes residents a little bit nervous when they're seeing uh, other cities' trucks you know, um, being used rather than the city of Revere. So I understand. Um, thank you, and I, I, I appreciate it. Everything else in terms of your, your numbers look pretty much level funded, so there's no question from me, Council, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Serino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, through you uh, to the Chief, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, to kind of build off of uh, Council President Visconti's questions, uh, when we do borrow fire trucks from other communities like Chelsea or whatnot, do we pay them? Are we, like, are we renting them essentially? Or is it a compact where, you know, if one of theirs breaks down, we send it to We them? have a compact with, okay. with, with 35 other cities and towns that, that make up Metro Fire in our agreement. And, and we provide resources for fires, emergencies, station coverages, and things of this nature when we've got our apparatus going down. And I must say, all, all our surrounding communities have been um, fantastic about it. They've been very helpful. And again, we, we like to reciprocate when, when it's our time, too. You know? And do other cities like Chelsea or surrounding communities, do they ever really fix their fire trucks in-house? Or like us, do they send them out to be serviced? Chelsea has a civilian mechanic. Um, they, they have a better facility for taking care of certain things in-house for, for certain, um, but they, they are not set up to do, to do all the work in-house, no. But they probably do a fair amount 
and save a considerable amount of money with that with that civilian position. I, I, that's my uh, understanding. And, Mr. Chairman, this one uh, through you to Mr. Visquet. Uh, when we discussed ARPA, I know that with ARPA there are certain buckets that the federal government tells you you can invest money in and spend it on. Um, through the presentation, I really didn't see anything relative to public safety. Is there, is one of the buckets, could the city invest some of that ARPA dollars into equipment, say fire trucks or um, equipment like that? Yeah, we most certainly could, and, and like we uh, explained in the presentation, we've either expended or committed 18 million of the 30 million, so we still have a lot of meat on the bone. And, and I have been having conversations with the fire department about those exact things, and we have capital equipment for the fire department in that capital fund, so it's just a matter of uh, going down and having more discussions about uh, dollar swapping, and I, and, I, and I have spoken to the mayor about it, and he is totally on board with the ability to purchase a fire truck uh, that has a 20-year useful life, which will really be the intent of those dollars to kind of have something that's going to last beyond that temporary dollar. So uh, we're talking with some of the firefighters right now, not only about that, but all the repairs, you know, a chief can attest to that. We've been right there whenever he needs the, the money or an override or an, uh, an exemption for uh, procurement because these are emergency vehicles. We work pretty closely with them to get those vehicles back on the road. Sometimes we're just a matter of the, the, the workloads at these repair shops and trying to get them back. So we have a pretty good relationship and a, and a good uh, uh, dialogue between us on all the equipment that's needed over there. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, one more question to Mr. Visquet as we're talking about um, fire equipment and more just a general question about equipment citywide. You know, as uh, the chief just said, you know, other some other communities do have in-house civilian mechanics. With different departments that we're creating using ARPA dollars, could we possibly create some sort of department within the DPW or um, to, to fix, you know, and to, to be a mechanic for in-house services rather than sending our city equipment elsewhere? Sure. Uh, I know that I've worked in different cities and towns that have what they call an internal service fund, which would be basically a garage, and you kind of pay yourself internally for those services, just so you have some cost allocation. So if it was, a, let's say, the DPW has a lift and is able to work on multiple vehicles and the parking department or the police department and such went down, we can definitely create an internal service that um, would service those vehicles. We'd do some cost analysis to see if the cost is worth the benefit. I think with regard to police, uh, firefighting equipment, that's pretty specialized, so that's why it'd be probably better to keep a, a specialist at the fire department, but for their um, administrative vehicles and such, if, if, if the mechanic at the fire station was working on, say, you know, big pumpers and ladder trucks, we can certainly expand that service, but it would probably be a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis, but it's uh, certainly something I've seen done. Thank you, Mr. Just for point of information, Council, I was told that the new DPW facility would have a lift that would have the capability of working on some uh, mass vehicles, so that'd be, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Council. Council Cogliandro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, good to see you. Uh, good thanks to see for you. being here. Uh, I just want to add to the comments of Councilor Visconti. Uh, the, the number of total calls caught my eye, 32 calls a day you guys are responding to on average and half of them are under five minutes. I just, again, want to say that's absolutely amazing. Um, I, one of the line items caught my eye here, the, the gasoline. Um, do you anticipate that $50,000 is going to be enough uh, with the rising gas prices? Thank you, Council, for the kind words. We take great pride in, um, in responding as, as quickly as, as, and safely as possible. Um, regarding the, the, the gas line item, we're probably going to run short, I'm, I would imagine. You know, I, I know that uh, Chief Financial Officer Biscay is always very good. If we need to, you know, um, move something around that's necessary, we'll, we'll do that like we do pretty much every year. Yeah, if I could add to that, we just, we're a little hesitant to start um, rising up all the appropriations for gasoline because, I mean, I think most of us hope that this $5 a gallon is uh, temporary in nature, but those utilities, it, it, it's tough to kind of, you know, budget to that spike and then have that surplus. So, you know, we, we, we go in a little bit uh, 
hesitant with some of those numbers, but we know that that's a pretty uh, legitimate reason to come back in if we need a supplemental. But we always try to work within the, the bottom line appropriations to address that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Silvestri, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chief, thank you. Um, again, I'd like to commend the fire department on um, the, the last few years. Uh, it has been abnormally um, calls, uh, things you've dealt with, uh, the FEMA, the MEMA, and, and you guys really stepped up to the plate. Um, my question, and I'm not sure, maybe it falls into where some of the medical or, or something is, um, in, in this climate, in, in the, the increase in calls, in, in, um, is there any, uh, anything that you have in-house or, or means that the men and women can, can use for mental health um, support? Uh, you know, going into calls on a daily basis, children, elderly, um, deaths, uh, takes a toll on a human. And I know in, in coming from a military background, you know, back in the day, police, fire, military, it, it was, you know, you, you, con you were considered weak if you were looking for support in those areas. Um, I'm glad that has changed, and I'm just wondering if we have anything in place, um, and if not, how can we help you as a council get uh, something appropriated to do so. Thank you for that question, uh, Council. I appreciate it. I, I, I think um, it's fair to say the fire service has really been the leader in recognizing that problem. And going back for the past 20, 30 years, um, from, this, from the International Union down to the, to the uh, PFFM and on the state level, even, uh, local, I mean, we have a SISM officer you know, as soon as we get any type of a critical incident like that, you know, we have like a standard operating procedure that we call into play, you know, and I've seen it over the years, you know, a, a bunch of times. I was part of a, a couple myself. Um, but I think we have that pretty well under wraps. There's really no great need. I, I will speak to the union president in that regard also, but I, I think we do a pretty good handle, uh, have a pretty good handle on uh, looking out for people who may be having difficulty or had a, a, a terrible uh, incident call, they had to deal with, say, the death of a child or something like that, and they might have just had a child at home, things, things of that nature. We try to, but uh, as you know, part, part of your, your service and our service, it's, it's a tough, it can be a tough go sometimes. But, but thank you for your consideration. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much, and thank you, Chief, uh, again. I think everybody has commented on your response times, which have historically been tremendous. Uh, people obviously rely on it. Um, I, I just have, um, you know, just a couple, you know, like maybe a comment and, you know, like then just a couple questions because we go through this budget deliberation every single year, police and fire, police and fire, and, you know, we know we could use more in each department. So, I mean... Really, you know, I think historically you've had the support of the city council and hopefully the support of the administration when it comes to public safety. I mean, there's nothing here that we're going to, most of the stuff that's done is done through collective bargaining. So there's not much stuff in here that the city council is going to go in and start tearing apart, right? I mean, it's just, it pretty much, it pretty much is what it is, but, um, you know, we know that with a growing community, we want to raise the staffing levels so that they meet the demand of uh, what it is. I mean, I was looking at the anticipated number of calls, 8,300 calls up, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, it looks like from, uh, from uh, oh, what was it? We're doing about 12,000 calls a year, close to it. From, from two, I'm sorry, from 2000, uh, you know, from 2000, 20 to now from 6783 you're anticipating about 8300 calls and that's with just existing stations that we have so obviously there's going to be a heavier workload on the on the people that are there um, so you know again there's always going to be that need for staffing in a growing community just a couple quick questions uh, actually three questions um, the 17 member grant that you have through the safer program yes. is that when are we going to get the results from that? When are we going to get an answer on that? 
And then, and then if I could just follow up for the second part of that, how many years would the SAFER grant fund those firefighters for? Okay. One, I don't know exactly when the date of the grant will be announced. They start rolling them out this summer. Uh, it's usually longer than they said originally, like everything else has been the past couple of years. So I'm, I'm hopeful by this summer we will know. We will know about that 17 firefighter grant we put in. The grant that we applied for, this year was the best one I've seen. It gives you three years and it pays everything. It pays salary, benefits, everything down the line for it. No, no, uh, you know, that's the best I can tell you there. And this is through the Federal Safer Program, right? Right. The federal government. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and um, I know we talked about grants for equipment or even just buying equipment. Does it make any sense? I mean, it's always been a little bone of contention for me to see a ladder truck responding to a medical aid call. I mean, is there something that we can get that, what, you know, because it, it would cost less to get a smaller type of vehicle to respond to medical aids, wouldn't it, than going out with ladder trucks? Yeah, but I don't see it that way. Um, I think the ladder trucks we have in a smaller district usually that they cover, and then if the engine's out, they may pick up that call too in, in the engines district. But all in all, I mean, um, you know, I don't have a problem with the ladder trucks um, uh, taking up the workload. There's, there's a, a, lot, a lot to do for just the four engines. And to put someone in a pickup truck or some other type of vehicle, taking them off the fire apparatus, or just manning some type of a vehicle with, I don't want to go in that direction. I think that's a poor direction for a city fire department to go. I think we should be, like we're doing, we're beefing up our facilities, uh, our personnel, our equipment, and we're getting ready for the challenges coming to the fastest growing city in, in, in the Commonwealth. I mean, we know we have a lot of water, right? A lot of water issues, a lot of flooding, a lot of storm surging. So again, we're trying to, we're try I've seen that happening more and more frequently. So we have a high water rescue vehicle online for this year. We've been training crazy with water stuff. We got a boat a couple of years ago on a grant. We've been training, having our members run through a captain's course on that. We've been training, sending people to everything you can possibly imagine for water rescue, getting people swift water rescue. In the currents, you know, all the gear, familiarization. I mean, you see us out on the beach. I mean, we do a lot of water calls. Years ago, I don't even remember getting any water calls. So we're trying, we're trying to prepare and. Uh, as best we can, but I think going in a direction of making crews just to respond for certain things instead of sending a ladder truck, I don't think that's a good direction to go. Well, well, okay, well, you know, I appreciate your opinion on that, and um, you know, just a question because obviously, you know, the you know, there's if there's ways that as city councilors we're not public safety professionals, but if there's ways that we might think about that could make make it a little bit easier for the members of the department or maybe you know take the load off a full-blown ladder truck to go to a, respond to a call that that's a question for you why we have these conversations every year so um one more question obviously we're coming into the summer months and uh cataldo ambulance do we have enough uh, of them on standby or are they are they we know, just negotiated a new contract with cataldo um We've increased the coverage in the city to have a third ambulance uh, with a paramedic and an EMT on it uh, for those peak periods where, we, where, the, where we're most busy. So that's gonna help a lot. I think the, the, the issue with Cataldo and the response time was an industry-wide problem. Every ambulance company in America probably experienced it the past three years. Um, not unlike the police, a lot of people are not going into those occupations anymore. It is, it, you, know, you don't get paid well enough for the, for the uh, responsibility and the, the, uh, you know, the risk, if you will. Um, so I think you'll see the response times improve dramatically this year as people great. start recovering, things start normalizing a little bit. Again, there will be times, like during maybe the sandcastles, where it's <laughs> the city's gridlocked. You have the summer tunnel projects underway now, getting getting started. There's going to be some, you know, some pain to deal with. But I, I do believe the ambulance response situation will improve uh, dramatically. And again, we always do our best to make sure we're there to give patient care until such time that an ambulance can come on scene. But well, that's good so. to hear that we've increased that level up to uh, three. So uh, 
Very good. Thank Very you. good. Thank you, Chief. If, uh, if there's no other questions, Chief, we appreciate you being here. Appreciate the work that you and the members of the department do every day. Uh, we're grateful for your service, and thank you very much again for coming here before us like you do every year. Thank you, Chairman Rizzo. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Chairman, if you want to take inspection, I can do the last two. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, sure. All right, so uh, you want to go to municipal inspections then? Yeah, I mean, I'll do the last Okay. So. Michael, we'll go to uh, municipal inspection, inspections, page 69. Good evening, counselors. You guys want me to jump right into the numbers? Or? Yeah, I mean, if you just want to give us kind of similar to what Chief Bright just sure. did, if you want, just want to go over some of the things you worked on in 22, maybe, you know, bring us up to speed on some projects that you might be looking at for 23, and then we'll go right into the numbers after yep. that. Um, so piggybacking off the fire department, um, as municipal inspections, we try to um, put in place systems so the fire department doesn't have to respond um, and have those, you know, fatal emergencies um, upon their response. So our goal is to ensure the safety and welfare of the general public by educating on health risks and benefits and enforcement through inspections, licensing, and permitting of state laws and city ordinances. Uh, some of our accomplishments in FY22 uh, we were able to get all of our building jackets in permit books uh, scanned. So those are now all electronic documents. We continue to improve upon the cleanliness of the city and decreasing the rodent population through diligent enforcement of the trash ordinance. We continue additional code enforcement to dumpsters as well, provide efficient intake process and effective investigation of all code enforcement concerns. We work uh, with, in conjunction with the Commission on Disabilities to ensure that there are not any obstructions to walkways while the inspectors are out on their routes. Um, we, current, uh, we worked with Northeast Mosquito Control uh, to ensure and reduce the mosquito population. Uh, we were able to add a part-time on-call electrical inspector, uh, moving that position, which we'll talk about, into a full-time position. Um, the office has undergone a uh, long overdue renovation um, creating a more inviting space for the residents and a uh, better morale environment for the employees. Going into uh, 2023, continue working in conjunction with the fire department to identify and address non-compliant properties. Maintain inspection results of retail store scanners and electronic scales. We're going to get weights and measures up on um, electronically. Provide uh, public access to food establishment inspections. Automate internal communications um, with some software programs and um, automate all of our safe housing inspections and interior housing inspections with some new software as well. So our department is um, moving in a more of a technological way uh, to be able to do things more proficient. This past year, uh, we issued a little over 1,600 building permits a little over, just under 1,400 electrical permits and just about 1,200 plumbing and gas permits. Uh, we've decreased our um, exterior code violations, which is the direction we want to go in. Um, interior housing, we've had issued over uh, just under 1,200 certificates of fitness, over 600 um, inspections for food and tobacco establishments in uh, about 300 gas pump inspections, 220 scanner and scale inspections. Safe Housing Task Force, enforcing code compliance under the State Sanitary Code of 40U, incorporating blighted properties, unpermitted work, and protecting the health and safety and well-being of occupants of the housing and general public. Currently have 313 properties in our Safe Housing Task Force. Um, some success stories, I believe you guys were handed a copy of that today. Um, we have some uh, properties that are listed. Uh, one of them, 83 Brad Street Ave, was a vacant three-family home that was ultimately resolved and transformed into a commercial apartment building. Um, there's some before and after pictures on there as well. 242 Mountain Ave, um, 
Actually, this was a fire property back in February of 2022. Um, the owner at the time left the property unsecured, city had to step in, uh, we had to get the uh, property demoed and that was uh, recently sold and there is a, currently a new building there today. Also 1470 North Shore Road, if some of you know, Stearns Hardware, um, then became a family dollar with a lot of issues there when family dollar was there and most recently um, we worked with that contractor there and is now fair price market and uh, no longer a blight to that area. Jumping into the numbers part, um, on the payroll section, increased um, by two inspectors. Uh, we're adding an additional um, full-time electrical inspector and adding a full-time building inspector. And on the non-payroll side, uh, we had some computer operations, as I stated, on the technology side. Uh, we are adding a new housing program, uh, housing technology, for the inspectors to use out in the field. Uh, we budgeted some money for uh, storage of our plans that are taking up one of the classrooms at the McKinley School. And we also uh, budgeted to get a lot of our um, health records scanned as well. So those are the increases. Okay, any councilors have any questions? Council Ms. Conti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Cheryl and Lewis, for um, all, all of you being here today. Um, I know, uh, I'm sure, I want to first thank, thank you guys for um, always uh, assisting. There was a time there that I was calling you on a regular basis and probably uh, showing up into your office uh, quite regularly and, uh, you know, going through some uh, issues with residents in the city. So I want to thank you first for, um, you know, opening your doors and, and working with me to help these residents, uh, you know, try to fix the problems um, that they're enduring. Um, I, 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 looking at the employees, I think uh, uh, with such a growing city, I, I I kind of agree that we're going to need uh, uh, a new or another uh, electrical inspector along with uh, a, a building inspector. I think that's a, a needed item in that department, um, you know, to, uh, to reduce the, the, the appointments and the time frames of, of getting these inspections done. I know that's been a concern as well, uh, especially with the new ordinance that is coming in front of the city council at the end of the month i'm sure that's going to build up the the calls as well and is going to put a little bit more pressure on you guys so um i want to uh, uh i'm want to let you know that i am in favor of that because i think it's it's definitely well needed in that uh in that department um if looking at the the cost everything seems to be uh in line um if you can just go over the uh, other salary sources for, I think there's two positions, um, one being a, a special assistant to the director and the principal clerk. And if they're paid outside of the, uh, uh, out of the budget, out of the general fund, if you can just help me uh, understand where that money is coming from. Yeah. Um, the, uh, those are that, paid out of the 40U account. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. And, and Cheryl so, now falls under uh, the solicitor's office. Yes, but is that uh, is your salary as well under the 40U account? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. I want to uh, just uh, thank you once again, your team, for, uh, like I said, um, helping me with uh, any of the problems that come my way. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the committee, any questions? Councilor uh, Silvestri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mike, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm kind of piggybacking off of uh, Councillor Visconti's uh, question, and um, uh, I'm happy to see that uh, you are getting the additional help. Um, my question is, do you think that is enough? Um, and I know we all want more help always, but do you think 
the few bodies that we are adding is enough with the growing amount of work that's happening in the city um, and, and, the, and the amount of calls and, and workload that your um, inspectors have already. Uh, do, you, do you think you're, you're getting enough um, addition in that area? I would never refuse anymore, but I think um, that is definitely fair uh, for what you know is being offered this year for an additional building inspector and electrical inspector. Um, what we need to realize too, you know, with, with those numbers that I that I spoke about um, on a building permit or electrical permit, for example, you know, just under 1,400 permits issued. Um, every ins every permit has a rough inspection and a final inspection. Um, and not all, either one of them always pass. So you're talking almost three inspections per permit. Um, so 1,400 um, electrical permits, you're looking at 5,200 inspections, um, give or take. So um, I think, you know, with, with the addition of uh, an additional one that it should be sufficient for right now, um, maybe another office clerk to, to keep up uh, with, with the permits, but um, we'll take the, the inspectors right now. Thank and you. lastly, I just want to uh, commend um, uh, being right across the hall. I get I get a front row seat at the, um, at the uh, show. Uh, residents that come in and, and always not the happiest at times. Um, and, and the amount of um, disrespect, uh, vulgarity, and, and and issues thrown your staff's way, uh, I just commend you and. and them on the professionalism they keep and in, in, uh, maintain while facing those issues. Um, it, it's always uh, above board and professional. So I want to commend you and in, in your staff on that as Thank well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other counselors have any questions? No other counselors. I, 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 don't, have any, uh, I don't have any real questions pertaining to the budget. I do... Um, you know, if you could just tell me a little bit about how you're handling uh, the uh, Northeast Massachusetts mosquito control, how are we dealing with that? I, and uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm asking is because just at our last council meeting, I had a parent uh, who had their uh, their son at a little league game. I, I, I'm not sure which field it was at. I think it might have been down behind St. Mary's. Um, I think that's Griswold Park now, but. Um, you know, they were complaining down there about mosquitoes. So what is the plan to, you know, not just for, you know, um, the way, you know, to, you know, like to make people more comfortable, but of course the threat of West Nile always. So right. what's the, um, what's the plan? Or so just this year, Counselor, um, Northeast Mosquito has been now being handled by the public health department. So under Lauren Buck, um, it was under inspectional services for quite some time. Um, so when a West Nile scare does come up or, you know, um, it's handled by the public health department at this point. So Lauren and her team are now handling Northeast Mosquito for moving forward in fiscal year 23. However, residents can put a, um, a um, request in for their area to be sprayed. Um, the areas are sprayed at night. The parks are sprayed at night as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, when we don't have any rain, um, does, doesn't always help, you know, or if it does rain after they spray, that, that it kind of defeats a little bit. So it hasn't been too rainy, but um, Lauren might be able to give you a little more insight onto the program they have with uh, Northeast Mosquito this year. Okay. Um, well, then, you know, yeah, I, I think that we'll have to uh, probably get that department involved because, you know, it. You know, if uh, it, I mean, I know like the kids playing soccer down Absolutely. at like uh, you know what down behind Tap we have. I mean, they those kids were going crazy last year. I remember and, when my uh, kids were little. Yeah, uh, being yeah, at yeah. the park and you were constantly uh, so you went um, home eating alive. Yeah, yeah. So uh, all right, well, Michael, thank you very much for my being pleasure. here. If there's no other councils that have questions, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your input, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Thank this you. coming Thursday. Okay, Absolutely. you got it. Okay, so we'll move along to uh, the rec center, page 67. Thank you, Mr. President and Council. Um, on behalf of the Metro North Regional Emergency Communication Center, 
Um, I will present the budget. It is um, one figure. It's basically an assessment that we get from the uh, 911 center. Um, just to give you a little insight, I won't go through all of the goals and accomplishments. However, um, there are several accomplishments. One that isn't mentioned is um, we did hire a new director, Elizabeth Belmonte, who happens to be a Revere resident. And uh, we were able to um, hire her from Cambridge, Mass, where she was um, involved at the 9-11 Center over there and uh, comes with a very strong background, especially in training. So uh, we were very pleased to bring her on board as the executive director and uh, she's doing a tremendous job. I sit on the board as a representative of the mayor. As you may all know, it's uh, the police and fire chiefs or the designees, town manager in Winthrop, mayor in Revere, and a seventh member who's currently uh, Jay Mazzola, who is a former firefighter in the city. So that makes up the board. We meet once a month. We review the budgets. We set policy. We help guide the operations. Um, the budget before you for fiscal year 23 is uh, pretty lean, and I say that um, even though it is going up um, about $40,000, that does include the uh, collective bargaining agreements that were, uh, that were agreed to between the 9-11 uh, call takers and, and the, uh, the board. So um, just to give you a little insight, half of the uh, assessment is the population of the respective towns and city. Uh, we had 74% of the population in 2022 with the new um, census track. We are at 76.3% of that. And then the call volume is the other 50% of which was 79% Revere and 21% Winthrop in 2022. It's gone up to 80.3% and 19.7% uh, for fiscal year 23. So when you take those two and you combine them, the city now is 78.3% uh, uh, of that operation, up from 766 So most of that increase is really just due to the fact that we represent a, a bigger portion due to the call volume and the population. But um, that, that one assessment covers all the costs, the operating costs, the salaries. There's some uh, reserves in there that we keep for uh, unexpected items that may come up. and. Um, we have established an OPEB liability trust for the rec center, and we have begun to fund that in fiscal year 23. So um, it's kind of short and sweet, but happy to answer any particular questions on the call center as, as best I could for, for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any councilors? Councilor Cogliandro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hi, Mr. Viscay. So just a quick question. Um, I'm looking at the average dispatch dispatch times and FY20 uh, it seemed that they were all under a minute we go to FY2021 and they've increased significantly is that due to population growth or not uh, I'm just curious why that why so much longer in 2021 and also if uh, you know we don't have the projected numbers for 22 or 23 so thank you um. Councilor, I would probably feel more comfortable uh, getting back to you on that data because that was uh, taken from the director and her staff. So I'm happy to get back to you on, on that. No problem. Thank you so much. Any other councilors have any questions? The only question I have, uh, I don't see any. I don't see any questions from the committee members. So the only question that I have, I'm, you know, uh, when, you know, it was back, it was back during my administration back in. 20, well, God, it went on, I think, practically the whole time I was there trying to get it up and off the ground in conjunction with Winthrop. Um, but there was grant monies available at that point in time to help us put it together. There was going to be some ongoing grant money. Then there was going to be some community participation. How, how, so where are the revenues coming from to fund this right now? I mean, we see the expense portion, but where are the revenues coming to... Um, to pay for these call takers right now? Yeah, the assessment to Winthrop and Revere are the two main uh, sources. The third source is the E911 uh, revenue that comes in. That's a uh, entitlement grant based upon call volume there. I believe it was a $1.4 million um, receipt for fiscal year 2022, and that's what we've budgeted for 2023. So essentially it's the uh, assessments to the respective towns and cities. Well, there's only two and then that uh, recurring entitlement grant. 
but to your point, there's a lot of other grants that are available to try to get us a third member, and I know that uh, Ms. Belmonte is, is um, really focusing on trying to find a third partner, which will give us um, some substantial capital uh, dollars that could build us a real center, because just like you said earlier, the police department is growing, the population is growing, and, and having them uh, inside the police department is becoming a little more, a little more cramped. So there are some uh, efforts right now being put forward by the director to try to find that third partner and, and really get into some of the grants I think you're alluding to. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, just because I, I, I wasn't clear on it, what's the grant money that, this, that we're receiving to fund the rec center right now, and then what would the portion if there's any left over from Revere and Winthrop, like, do you know those numbers? Uh, like, I don't have them off the top of my head, but we, we estimate a grant dollar just like um, any other budget for grants. And if that, it's based upon the call volume. So the more calls we get, the more dollars we get from the 9-11 grant. If those dollars exceed what we budgeted, then our fourth quarter assessment is uh, credited that amount. And then we will, uh, that, that assessment will turn to free cash when uh, fiscal year ends and that, and that has happened in fiscal year 2022 we did get a credit on our fourth quarter bill then so which lowers our assessment but when we budget it we estimated 1.4 million if we get more than that then it's it's credited to the so uh, you estimate okay that i i think that's kind of going in the direction to answer my question so the e911 grant that that grant that the, that we get from e911 is 1.4 million Yes, right. That's the budget. Oh, that's yeah. I'm not going to hold you to the exact number, yeah. but and, and the and the amount that we're budgeting right now is 1.565. Correct. So that's right. And I think Winthrop's is uh, like 450, So those three are the three revenue sources. Okay. So to fund that whole department, how much is it to fund the whole department? If I, I could look it up on my telephone, or I can bring you that tomorrow and give you the whole breakdown of how that budget works, revenues and expenses, so, in its entirety. So you're saying the city is funding 1.565 million. That's yes. what. That's tax dollars. That's exclusive of any grant money. That's right. So essentially, the operation is is, is over a four million. Well, if it's 1.4, 1.5, that's three million. So yeah, you're talking about three and a half million dollar operation for the 9/11 Center. Now, how, how many call takers do we have? Is that in here? I, we don't have the number of call takers. I, I mean, it just. Um, I mean, I'd just be curious to know. It's four million dollars. I don't know how many call takers we have. Granted, it's a twenty-four-seven operation, so I do understand that. But I just don't know how many people we have working round the clock. Um, yeah, I certainly can, get you. I can grab you those numbers, and I'll, I'll bring them before okay. you tomorrow for sure. There's All a right. breakdown. I actually thought it was going to be part of this budget, and I apologize that it's not in here. But um, no, we do have the total um, the total apportionment of the dollars coming in and the budget and then the assessment to the both communities. So we can certainly get you that. All right. That's all the questions I have. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Councilor Silvestri, you have a question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a point of information on... Um, uh, the, the call time because I, I did check in and I looked into that because I, I thought it may have been a typo um, but the call time in 2020 um, compared in, in the, the response time has gone up uh, and that was due to traffic in COVID no one was on the roads um, during that time there was very few cars and, and, and means of um, traffic so the, the, the calls were a lot they were responding to calls a lot faster than they can to um, now with, with the traffic that are on the roads was the explanation I was given. Thank you. Thanks for, well, thanks for that info. And, and, and even though it says projected 2022 NA, obviously we're in fiscal year 22, but I think we could get some data for the, at least the first nine months just to see how it compares across the board. So I'll try to um, extrapolate some of that data out as well so we can have a better uh, sample size. Sure. I, I, just to follow up, though, to uh, Councilor Silvestri's point, because I, I'm not sure. Like you know, when I looked at it after Councilor Cogliandro had brought it up, it looked you know higher, and then but not like this says average dispatch time, right? Not average response time. Like I, I find it hard to believe that a, a fire truck would respond in one point one one minute and thirty nine seconds to an average call. I don't think that's 
I th this says average dispatch time, so I'm just concerned why the dispatch time would have increased. I mean, would that did they reduce the was there did we lose some call takers or you know and have uh, you know longer times before uh, the calls were answered? Uh, do you know any of that? Uh, maybe we could get that information from the new director and see if they if she, if she might understand why. Uh, why that difference? Uh, because it, it does seem significant, to be honest with you. Yeah, there's certainly great questions, and, I, and, I'm, and I'll uh, reach out to uh, Ms. Belmonte and try to get some uh, clarification on I that. I mean, somebody's calling 911, you know, you start ticking off seconds, a minute and 39 seconds. That's a long time if somebody's in, uh, in crisis mode, you know. So um, that would be, I think that's something that it would be great if you could get us that information. Uh, yeah, I, I do know just on a, on a macro level that they, they, they've had some of the same struggles as the uh, police trying to get people in there, get them trained, to get them dispatched. So I know they did have some staffing issues, but I don't want okay. I, I, I to go ahead and, and, and say it's because of that. I'd, I'd rather get you the complete okay. information. Okay, fair enough. Um, no other questions? Any counselors have any other questions? Uh, Rich, okay, this will be about your seventh department you're going to do right here. Um, so we'll move on from the rec, and uh, I, I take it you're going to do parking control? Yes, sir. Um, Page 75? Yes. Um, okay. Unfortunately, uh, the director, he is uh, under the weather. It felt like it would be best for him to stay away from everybody. So uh, uh, Luis Juarez is here, the assistant uh, director here. Uh, thank him for his support. Um, can certainly walk through some of these accomplishments. Um, we did successfully implement the uh, overnight uh, park, uh, resident parking program, uh, two overnight offices to patrol the 500 streets of the city. I believe that's um, going fairly well, uh, whether it's because those people are registering their cars and we're getting that um, excise revenue or simply creating capacity on the streets uh, for, the, for the people who actually live in the city. Uh, we did launch a business parking permit program to allow business owners to buy a discounted business pass to park in the Central Street lot, which we've expanded over to um, the McKinley School. And that's, um, I think we sold over 100 of those passes right now. Uh, we've come up with different ways to pay the parking meters. We have the payment app. We have credit cards. We have coins. Uh, that's going really well. We've seen a, a tremendous increase in the parking revenue, which I can tell you a little bit about uh, during the budget. Um, we created the Park and Benefits District with the help of the council voting that successfully, so we will start to um, implement that. Park and Benefits District will allow for some more, um, more ways to spend park and meter money, uh, not just on employees and, and equipment and, and the internet that requires to run those meters, but we can do some additional tree planting, put some benches down, put some security lights, all kinds of things that we'll, uh, we'll implement in 2023. Um, we cleaned up the Central Ave lot. We work with the Director of Elder Services to make sure that all senior center events have uh, plenty of parking free of charge. Um, you know, the goals for 2023 is to create that parking benefits district committee and find different ways to utilize some of the meter money coming in. Uh, we keep working, we're trying to work closely with DCI just to clarify some of the parking related issues down there. You need a sticker, there's no sticker, there's signs, there's no signs. Uh, we're trying to work closely with DCI to try to really help the residents understand what is and what isn't legal in that Revere Beach, Broad Sound area and such. Um, we are, before you, uh, I think we're going to talk about at the next meeting, we're trying to create a revolving fund for the electric vehicles charging stations. Right now we're not charging any money, uh, which is a nice feature. We see more and more activity using them. However, we have a couple broken ones now at the Hill School, and we realize we don't really have a funding source to fix these machines once they come in, so we're researching, charging some fee for those charging stations, just like a meter, and, and regenerate those dollars to either add more of those features or, or fix the meters when they break. And uh, we're continuing to look for uh, options for businesses, residents, and employees in the city to park. Uh, the McKinley School has uh, been utilized uh, as a business lot, and I, I believe and before the Traffic and Parking Commission, there are some modifications and how we can use that lot to uh, increase the capacity in the downtown business district. So those are briefly through the goals and accomplishments and uh, objectives. Within the budget itself, there is a proposal. There was a proposal to hire uh, uh, an additional parking control officer and, and a, a clerk to help with the volume of work in there. 
we did uh, reduce one parking control officer and we funded uh, some overtime money to use existing offices to cover some of the gaps in vacation. Figure it would save us on the benefits in, in retirement um, costs that come along with a new full-time equivalent, but we are requesting to hire a clerk to a low-level clerk just to help with the volume of calls and the volume of foot traffic that comes in there. We are, um, we generate approximately one and a half million dollars in, in, in revenue through uh, enforcement. Uh, parking meter receipts um, are estimated they're coming at about 175000 this year, of which uh, pays for three offices, so you'll see total salary other sources. We do have three parking control offices that are paid exclusively through the parking meter receipts, which brings down the budget by 157000 which we find to be very helpful. And, um, you know, costs for the department are, are pretty lean. We have $5,000 for printing and mailing, and... Um, we have some money in office supplies basically to fund the residential parking permit program in the city. Most other expenses of uh, the office are, are paid through the parking meter receipts. So happy to answer any questions on that budget. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that presentation. Any members of the committee uh, wishing to be heard? No members of the committee? Councilor Silvestri. Thank you. Excuse me, Council. Uh, Mr. Viscay already knows the questions I'm going to ask, so he's already answered a lot of them. So uh, I'm all uh, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Rich, for pres presenting tonight, and Lewis for being here. Um, my question is: uh, Now that we're, we're we have a 24-hour parking um, department, more or less. Um, it, I've had a few people that have um, put in for the for the overnight position, and, and the reason they didn't take them was uh, this no nighttime differential that uh, a parking meter um, or a parking attendant that works from the morning to the afternoon into the evening will get paid as the same as someone that works overnight. Has there been ever, any idea or, or, or thought process behind even a dollar or two offered given to give someone um, who is willing to work those overnight shifts? Um, just uh, I, I don't like adding, but but um, it was it was brought to my attention that a few people did refuse once offered the position because of that reason. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, Councilor, as part of the collective bargaining agreement with Unit B. There is a 6% afternoon differential and a 10% night differential that is part of the budget right now and, and was paid retroactively to those employees. But you're right, we were having trouble funding those positions at flat rates and uh, through collective bargaining. There, there was differentials put in for both the afternoon shift that goes from 3 to 11 and then we have the overnight shift at 10%. Uh, so if you look at the salaries that are proposed, you can probably pick out the ones that are receiving those differentials. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Cogliandro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a, a question about staffing. How many overnight uh, parking control employees do we have on any given night? We have two regularly, regularly scheduled parking control officers. And again, um, in working with Zach and Lewis, talking about the staffing levels, we were contemplating trying to add a third officer and um, just looking at the volume of the offices we have, now that we've added a couple, it was uh, more financially prudent to just fund some overtime to fill those gaps if there's you know, certain times of the year or certain uh, areas that might need additional reinforcement. And we also fund a uh, second shift officer who's out there enforcing the meters in the parking up until that night shift comes in. So like Council Silvestri said, it is pretty much a 24-7 operation at this point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I ask because I do get a lot of phone calls. I'm sure the other ward councilors do as well about, you know, cars uh, being parked by businesses on side streets and, and neighborhoods and things like that. So, you know, if we at some point could increase the number of people overnight, that would be fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If there are no other questions, um, I think that will do it for tonight or for t this afternoon. Um, tomorrow... Uh, we'll be meeting again from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, for those councillors that can make it. I appreciate the councillors that have participated so far. And uh, 
appreciate our city clerk, uh, Ashley Melnick, being here with us, and certainly you, uh, Rich, for uh, being here. You're up on your fifth or sixth department pr presentation, so we'll keep that going tomorrow. I don't know how far it'll have to go tomorrow, but we'll see. Um, and uh, with that, if, unless there's any further business from members of the committee or members of the council, uh, yes, Councilor Serino. Mr. Chairman, if I might just take a moment to wish one of our colleagues, Councilor Silvestri, a happy birthday. He came tonight despite not being on the committee and despite it being his birthday. So happy birthday, Mark. Well, we wish him a very happy birthday. Happy, healthy one. Okay. Um, good note to end on. With that, we'll see everyone back here at 5 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you.